On today's episode of the Locked on Texan podcast, what could be considered a failure for this upcoming season and mental health matters? I speak with Natalia Farr, founder of Best by Far Sports Counseling and PR Agency to discuss mental health and athletes. But before we have any conversation, you are Locked on Texans, your daily podcast on the Houston Texans. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to a Thursday edition of the Locked On Texan Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm John, some sports guy Hickman, unfortunately, doing a solo show for this Thursday episode of the Locked On Texans. However, Cody will be back with us soon. You just got some fun with me. We're going to rock out and have a great conversation surrounding mental health and the importance of learning more about it and getting involved. But before we dive into that that conversation with Natalia Farr, what could actually be considered a failure for the 2022 NFL season for the Houston Texans? And to speak freely, right? I think if you do not improve on the past transgressions and failures this upcoming season from last year, then I think you can look at this season as a failure. I'm not that person who's going to get caught up in wins and losses. This is the NFL. We've seen teams that have been considered to be preseason favorites not have good seasons, right? But when you look at the Houston Texans, it's not necessarily when it's all said and done, whether they go 7-10 and 10 or 6 or 11 or 3-14. and 14, That won't be the case necessarily. I think just making sure that you are improving on what – you failed to do good last season, making some strides to get better. And so not improving on those struggles from last year. What were some of those struggles? Well, only 1,400 rushing yards on the season. That's total. 3.3 rushing yards per carry. Houston was one of the most penalized teams in the 2021 season with 114 penalties. One of the top teams in unnecessary roughness calls, offensive holding, and offensive pass and interference. Failed to put points on the board. Only 16.5 points per game. That's never going to cut it. And a difficult time making stops in the second half. More plays ran on them in that second half, which led to the defense, you know, looking worse than what they did in the first half because they were on the field a lot, right? And so we can't talk about what's going to make this team better if we do not provide solutions. Now, defense does win championships, but offense wins games. And expectations for Pep Hamilton are high. Offensively, we can expect a power run, hence the offseason signing of Marlon Mack and drafting Damian Pierce. Both of those guys, whether that's college or in the pros, have historically good numbers in terms of rushing per carry. Uh, for Marlon Mack, he sits around 4.7 yards per carry. And Damian Pierce was an absolute stud in limited time in Florida. He rushes for about five, four to 4.8 to 5 yards per carry. So he can fall forward and get you a couple of yards, right? Uh, the Texans, excuse me, so that screams Pep Hamilton. But also under Pep Hamilton, the Houston Texans should look to stretch the field a lot more this year. Texans were towards the bottom of the league and intended air yards didn't take a lot of shots down the field. That should also change in the 2022 season. A similar situation for Pip when he was in Indy from year one to year two. They went from ranking 14th in deep ball attempts to the to first the very next year. And so the development of Nico Collins is also something that I want to point to. It's very important. Hopefully we'll see a lot of those big plays out of him in this season like we saw or compared to last season and get those big plays like we saw out of him in Michigan, which is why I think Houston really liked bringing him in uh, in the 2020 season, 2021 season. So the Texans must be better coached as well. They have to limit those penalties. That speaks directly to the calm leadership of Lovey Smith. And when we look at those penalties, Lovey Smith did have a team uh, during his Chicago Bear years, that team was flagged a lot specifically for false starts. And so everybody is walking into this season 
in the 2022 season, looking to make improvements, whether that is from year one under Pip Hamilton as a QB coach, now to year two as he is officially the offensive coordinator, even for Lovey Smith, looking at making those improvements from his last head coaching gig in the NFL with the Chicago Bears to where he is now. And so, again, this isn't a conversation surrounded by wins and losses. And I know that's important for the Texans who've lost um, 12 to 14 games in the last two years, only won four games, eight games in the last two years, four in the past two seasons each. They want to get some more dubs. I get it. The fans are anxious to get some wins. You guys are going crazy in your group chat because everybody else can talk about making the playoffs. Everybody else can talk about explosive offensive games. And the Texans are just kind of quiet. Texas fans are sitting in the back with their, with, you know, with their, not saying too much or laughing emojis, but not really being able to speak because they don't have that experience the last couple of years. People are anxious to see that, but we can't scream development, 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 and then quickly jump to getting more wins. The development has to be there. And in terms of looking at the development, well, you just got to get better. Right. That's a big reason why they moved on from David Cully. They knew they were not going to get better under David Cully Tudorich. That's a big reason why when they hired Lovey Smith, look at what they were able to give him. They brought they gave him Pep Hamilton, which they didn't want to lose him. They were able to go out there and give him Derek Stingley on the defensive side of the ball, which he will do, I think, wonders with helping that defense get off the field. But then they go out and draft well, drafting players with high ceilings like a John Mechie, who, by the way, I don't think Mechie will be one of those big play receivers, but he will be good after the catch. And so he'll extend a lot of these downs, just being able to take five or six or seven yard catches and going out there and getting you 15 to 18 because he's so good in open space. That's what's important. And so should the Texans go out there? Not should, but will they go out there and win 10 games? Like my co-host, Cody, who I wish was with me, uh, today, will they go out there and win 10 games? I don't see it. Let's be realistic. But if those improvements, if those improvements come in clear as day on tape from week one of the NFL season to week 18 of the NFL season, if they're just not able to put the wins up, but they're getting better at week in and week out, game in and game out, then you will look at this team as a possible destination to where players are looking at them and like, okay, well, they have some of the tools that they need to compete. They just got to go out there and get these X factor players. And so I'm excited to see what the Houston Texans are able to do this upcoming season. More excited to have this conversation surrounding mental health. May is the official month of mental health. This is a topic that is kind of fairly new in terms of mental health and athletes. And so it's very important for us to have this discussion. We can't say that we're going to cover these athletes and cover these uh, professional teams and not talk about what affects the players that may affect them silently or they're trying to get the help that they need. And so us as, as fans, uh, our, their loved ones, everybody needs to be supportive and understand what goes on with mental health and athletes. An amazing conversation. I can't wait for you guys to have with, uh, wait to hear, excuse me, with Natalia Farr. We're going to dive into that shortly here at the Locked On Texas podcast. Before we have that discussion, this episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto store to stock all the parts your car needs. So why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse carries? You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Choose to spend less. It's always better. Inflation is at an all-time high right now. And so whenever you have an opportunity to save money and time, do that with Rock Auto. Rock Auto is also a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. And Rock Auto prices are always reliably low for every customer. Go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck. Right, Locked on Texans in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices. All the parts your car will ever need rockauto.com. 
Welcome back, Locked On Texans listeners and viewers out there. I am pleased to introduce Ms. Natalia Farr, founder of the Best by Far Counseling and PR Agency. A warm welcome to the Locked On Texan podcast. I'm super excited to have you on today's show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. And so the reason why I wanted to have this discussion today, right, it is Mental Health Month, the month of May. Here at the Locked On Texan podcast, we cover the Texans. We talk with athletes. We've been dealing with this for a long time, but I think that there is still maybe a stereotype or information that people do not know or maybe prejudge athletes on in terms of trying to get themselves together. So what are some of the most important stats on athletes' mental health and that some of people may not know or they should definitely consider? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest facts that we all have to pay attention to is that in this day, we have a recent study that came out about two years ago that states 35% of elite athletes, that's 35%, 15 away from 50%, struggle and suffer from some form of a mental health crisis, whether it manifests as stress, eating disorder, burnout, depression, anxiety. And so when you look at what an elite athlete is considered, that's usually considered someone that's on track to be an Olympian, someone professional. And also they have started reclassifying that to anyone who's played on a varsity level. So when you really think about that, you know a lot of elite athletes in your lifetime that you've come across. So I think that's something that we should all be super aware of that 35% of them are going to go through some type of mental health crisis or suffer from it. So the best thing you can do is just reach out to them. A lot of times we do forget that our athletes are people just like us, normal people that aren't immune to anything that comes their way. So just, I feel like that's something we should all know and be aware of is that such a vast number will suffer from some type of mental health issue or crisis. Absolutely. I want to continue with that. Mental health recognition is fairly new and uh, a new topic in terms of the discussion being centered around athletes. Uh, what are some of the different forms of mental health that can affect the players we see on the big screen and right in our backyard? You kind of yeah. just hinted at it. Let's dive into a little bit more. Absolutely. So a lot of the major things that we see are anxiety, whether it be general anxiety, performance related anxiety, um, PTSD, whether it be from some traumatic issue, but we see it a lot of times based on injuries. Any type of injury they suffer is going to be traumatic, life altering in some aspects. So that's something we work with a lot, ADD, ADHD. I have a few people that come to me saying they struggle to watch film with their team, but don't want to voice that because mental health isn't really something that we're talking about a lot more in our sports areas. Um, so that's a big thing that has recently started surfacing. And then eating disorders. So it's also a common thing among men. We don't talk about eating disorders within men. We always think about it with women. So those are some of our main things that we really work with in mental health with addressing our athletes. I'm hearing performance a lot. So mental health is one of those aspects where it does trickle down and we eventually see it on the court, the field, the, 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 the diamond. Performance is really, you know, it's connected to all of this, right? Absolutely. I always tell my clients, like our performance, if we feel good, we are going to do good. I mean, I look at myself, I'm nowhere near an elite athlete, did not play varsity sports at all. It's just involved as a trainer, uh, manager, things of that nature. But even me, when I go to work out, if I'm not having a good day, I don't want to do that workout. We have that moment ourselves. So imagine our athletes who are performing at such higher levels. They do this for a living. If they're not feeling good, it's all going to trickle down. You'll start seeing it, whether it be in their stats, their game performance, or just them having to take a long break from whatever it is that's going on. And so it's a little concerning as well, because when we're not performing well mentally, you see that trickle down into physical performance. And I start thinking of what about our injuries? Are we suffering in different ways? How we're preparing? Can we, we allow ourselves to kind of get a little, a little loose with how we're training, what we're holding ourselves to. And so you also have to think that injury could come in as well when we're not taking care of ourselves. What are some of the most common misconceptions when it comes to athletes' mental health? And I, before you answer that, I want to speak about maybe what I've seen. Uh, my brother mm -hmm. had to deal with that while he was in high school. And some of my friends that we just grew up with, the misconception that I saw was mentally weak. 
And then the older we've gotten and the more I've been around professional athletes and spoken with them off camera, there is the misconception of, well, you're using this as an excuse. Or then we look at medication and how they may uh, misconceive that, that you're using that medication as a, as a vice. What are some of those misconceptions that we really need to break away from, sit down and understand these athletes are going through it right now? Absolutely. I think the biggest misconception I hear just in telling people what I do is, oh, well, they can just get over it. They know how to perform high at a high rate. They can block that out. That's nothing but mental toughness. So then you have the weakness aspect come into it. And so, like I said earlier, we forget our athletes are real human beings that have real life things going on other than the game they're playing. Um, you know, we also put in pressures on them when we hear that they're expected to play a certain way for a certain game. Um, they have real life going on. And so that's one of our biggest misconceptions that they can just get over it because of who they are, what they have. Um, like you said, mental weakness, that's another thing. A lot of our athletes do not like to be considered weak. So that's why we don't speak about what's going on in our world. Because anytime you hear an athlete state that they have a mental health issue going on or a crisis, they're always called weak or you have people telling them that they should just get over it. And so medication as well. It's also scary. I think it all stems from the personal um, stigmas that we have on mental health because we have recently just started embracing mental health as a whole culture community. And so it won't get easier, unfortunately, for them until we continue to do more and their organizations step up to start breaking, breaking those stigmas that they have surrounding mental health. We got a lot more coming up discussing mental health, and then we're going to get to some PR agency stuff that you guys do as well. So Locked On Texan viewers and listeners out there, Ms. Natalia Farr, we'll be right back. Before I, before we break away, you're in the Dallas area, right? I am, Are yes. you a Cowboys fan? I am, but a rational Cowboys fan. Okay, because I had a, I was about to say, this may be the last time we talk <laughs> here with the Locked On Texans, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Our friends at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information. And first of all, find all of the latest odds, the news, and sports developments, including this year's basketball playoffs, the Major League Baseball scores, and fights, even next season's NFL futures. Bet Online is your continued source for all of your sporting wagering information from live betting to the playoffs esports, and much more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and actions heading over at betonline.com. And so go to betonline.com right now because BetOnline is where the game starts. Thanks for making Locked On Texans your first listen every day. Now make your second listen Locked On NFL. The schedule is out. Fans are going crazy in anticipation for throwing all kinds of parties and game day parties because you're ready to take on your rival. But the NFL never stops, and neither does Locked On NFL. Get insight and opinions from hosts, including Ross Jackson, Chris Carter, Tony Wiggins, plus local Locked On NFL hosts repping all 32 teams. There's no offseason for real fans. So make sure you are subscribed to the Locked On NFL on YouTube and wherever you get podcasts. Welcome back in. Thank you guys for sticking around, checking out today's episode of the Locked On Texan podcast. Sitting here with Natalia Farr of Best By Far PR Agency and Counseling. We're going to get to some PR agency stuff. And so your mission statement read, and I loved it. We serve as a counseling and PR agency that is passionate in integrating mental health into sports performance in order to help build athletes that are in their league physically and mentally. Can you expand on the importance of integrating counseling athletes and public relations? Absolutely. So that's something that I just stumbled across. I remember a few years ago, before I got into all of this, I started doing Instagram influencing. And so I remember how ta it got to a point to where, yes, the money was great, but I backed out myself because it was so mentally taxing. I just didn't like the lifestyle, the demands on it. So I have a lot of um, athletes that ask me to help them with social media. So what we do, some of them, they want to still run their own account. Some of them, I will run it for them and just let them do stories, comments, whatever, because social media is a place where these poor athletes get attacked. So I think about it in the same way. It's a lot of work to do Instagram. 
It's a lot of work when you're a public figure because you have people that have access to you. So social media, it's great for bringing us together, but it also is a very harmful tool in how it gives people access to you. So a lot of times with some of my athletes, they'll have someone in their inbox messaging them or commenting. So what we do, they'll just be like, hey, this person's in my inbox. I don't have the capacity for it. So I just go respond as their publicist. Like, hey, I'm their publicist. We don't tolerate this type of slander, this language, and just get it out of there, move on. So it's really, I love it that a lot of my clients trust me with that to kind of just be that first person in defense for them to block that harmful. They don't need that. They have a lot of other impacts. They read things about themselves. They see things on Twitter, on our social media platforms about them. That's one less thing I can take off their plate because they're human. I feel they should enjoy Instagram for what it has to offer them. So I let them do the fun parts of it. And I just handle the dirty work of deleting people, getting restricting users and things of that nature, because we live in a social world now. And that is very um, wearing on some of us. And you have some that have issues with anxiety, they may not be getting signed, they go on social media and see that their other friends are reporting for a training camp or doing something, getting a new deal that they're not. And so at that point, it comes to a point to where they're like, I'm logging off, you handle my social media, tell me what I need to do. So it's just me being able to be that line of defense for them to help protect their mentals during their time um, as they're still having to work and run things on Instagram. I love that you say a line of defense because I feel like you know, as regular people, right, in your world, in the job that you do, in my world, the job that we do, athletes are the same, all normal people, right? And so I feel like a lot of times what you do is very important and essential because unlike us, for the most part, we can attack back if we choose to, Absolutely. right? And we we know that in this social social world, athletes are not necessarily able to attack back on social media like like maybe like job Moret did the other day right but like they would probably normal want to because it affects their money and their image and if both of those things are getting affected then eventually i'm not getting signed i'm not getting playing time i'm being suspended now it does affect my mental health so all of that does go hand in hand it makes sense and I also saw in May 2021, you partnered with the Emmanuel Moutier Foundation to teach parents and athletes the importance of mental health, how to support their kids as athletes, right? And I think it's important to teach our adults, but also the parents, I mean, to teach our kids, but also the parents about the mental health. How was that process of explaining that something that is new and accessible to parents? How's that been? That has been a really great process. Uh, parents have been a lot more receptive than we thought they would be awesome. to this. Um, some of the schools I've gone to, colleges that I've gone to, have been so excited to see just the therapist on field with their child because you know you have transitions. Another part of what I did with Emmanuel Moutier's foundation was also integrating recruit mental health with the recruiting process because that's so hard. We have um, high schoolers being asked to make these tough decisions that will really impact their life. Um, moving forward. So parents are very receptive when they see that there's someone that can be that voice for their child, which is why I do what I do anyways with children, college athletes, professional athletes, to be a voice for them, advocate for them, whether I feel it's something um, that will help them or if it's a coach asking, do you think they're ready for this? No, they're not. Mentally, they're not. So parents especially love that because the parents can't be around 24 seven. So if they know their child has a safe person to go to, they are more than willing to partner with them. They know the demands that it places on their children, athletics and their school performance and things of that nature. So just having someone in their corner to support them outside of the family and coach is definitely a valuable resource. Best by far does work with teams uh, and to get a better understanding of what's going on with their athletes, correct? You guys work with professionals? Yes. Correct. Correct. So we've worked with a lot of college football teams and AAU teams, basketball teams. So what we do there is we go and we assess the team and see how they're communicating. What does the practice look like? What are we doing? Even all the way until post-practice, like how is our diet going when we go to lunch all together? Because I do like to teach my guys um, the mental health aspect of your diet that impacts you so much. Everything that we do impacts us. Um, so we help to create a safe space for our coaches, our staff, the team members on that whole organization to let them have a safe place to process their anxiety, be that go-between. Say they have something coming up and coaches don't know what's going on. That teammate feels they can't express that to the coach. They can come to me 
and they can let me express that to the coach with them, be that go between. So that way we can work, communicate with the coaching staff to let them know like, this isn't working for us. Let's adjust this. This is what we have going on. Um, a lot of times it's so beneficial in our college football area because these are top performing student athletes that are all also required to keep up a certain grade level academic life. So that really weighs on them. So we have to move things around, shuffle around to make sure that they're performing well athletically and academically. And we just assess any negative factors that impact individuals and the team as a whole. You know, I wonder with the great work that you do, how important this would have been if it was a real point of emphasis in the 90s, in the 80s, in the early 2000s. I mean, really in the early 2010s. And we've seen, especially when I look at football, this is a lot on Texas show, but when we've seen a lot of athletes within the last 15 to 20 years have the issues surrounding CTE. And now I can't help but wonder how important this, if it was, if people really cared and it was a point of emphasis, how important it may have impacted lives 20, 30 years, even 10 years ago. Have you had to deal with any uh, client that has issues with brain trauma or anything of that nature? Because football players start playing football fairly young a lot of times. They do, they do. And so that is one thing that, you know, it's always a passion to think about CTE. How can we start rewording that, reworking with it, preventing it if there's any way that we can. And I do have some athletes that come to me telling me that they're afraid that that's something that they'll have to deal with, which is very, um, it's very valid. You hear so much around it. You see things going on. You see jokes about it. It impacts them on social media as well, which is why we do PR things where they feel if I, oh, I spelled something wrong. People started saying I'm, I'm showing the onset of CTE. So just little jokes like that, things of that nature. And I wish that the league would get so much better about being preventative on that aspect. It could be something as simple as every season doing some tests to see where we're functioning at mentally to where if you ever catch a decline, you can start it and start treatment. However, you also have to have players buy in and a lot of our athletes haven't bought into mental health yet or therapy in any capacity. So um, what we're doing is we just advocate for our athletes. We say, if they voice a concern to me, I sit and talk to them and ask them like, what are the, what are the concerns you have? Why do you feel this way? If this is what you're feeling, um, if you feel that's any indicator of possibly CTE, let's start talking about getting your referrals. Let's work with your with the NFL to get you connected to the resources you have. And so we start helping them on that. Um, so I'm hoping, I'm hoping we get better at addressing these issues and coming around full circle to being preventative before they even become an issue or a problem area for any athlete. So that's what I'm hoping for. It would have made a difference if it would have been around years ago. However, I feel like mental health is a new concept that we're rediscovering and trying to learn how to put back into our culture in a healthy manner. So, yeah. Absolutely. Speaking of our culture, um, I'm an African-American male. I'm a minority. And we've mm-hmm. talked about athletes, right? But Absolutely. we've also said in the same breath, athletes are normal people, right? Everybody's a normal person. But how important is it for minority men to seek therapy? It is extremely important and it starts at home. A lot of times we've grown up in households where mental health is not encouraged. We're usually told to, you know, we can get through that. We don't see our families going to mental health therapy. And so I tell a lot of my clients like, hey, this is your life. You now start having families, you're getting married. So why don't you guys start thinking about therapy, integrating that into your household? Because it's a safe place. It's a great thing. Even me as a therapist, I had to get over my own stigma before I went to therapy myself, which is something I share with everybody. It's something that we need to do as a therapist. I was like, I can get over it. I teach people like how to be in tune with their feelings, how to better process things. But it took me a long time to go to therapy. Um, So for our minority males, it's just extremely hard because it's something that's not demonstrated at home at a young age. It's something that's not talked about. Also because we do not have access to mental health or resources for that in our communities growing up. And so that's another thing that we strive to provide with our agency by donating our time, our efforts, our knowledge to doing seminars with underprivileged groups in different areas, South Dallas areas, um, Fort Worth, where it's got a little bit of poverty in those areas. So we offer those resources because I can sit here and preach that I think every minority should have access to therapy. But if I'm not giving it 
I'm part of the problem as well, which is why I do strive to give the, that time and those resources back. Be the change you want to be. I like that. Absolutely, yeah. Let's take it back. Now, I believe that one's life purpose is important to recognize and achieve. And for you, the recognition of being an advocate for mental health for athletes was apparent at a young age. I read that it was at 16, right? That you knew that this was the direction of your life you wanted to go, which is amazing, right? That you was able to recognize it so young. What was your first experience for you that made you sit back and think to yourself, I have to go this route because if not me, nobody else will. Yeah, so it's a very interesting story. It's crazy how things come full circle, but I was wrapping one of our high school athletes' ankles, practicing how to wrap their ankle before a game, and they are now in the league, which is so crazy. They play football now. Um, so I remember they were talking to me about this game, and there, it was a tournament. It was a basketball tournament we had. And they're like, I'm not feeling this game tonight. We have three games. I'm not feeling it. And I was like, okay, what's going on? Just sitting there rapping and talking to them as a friend. So they started downloading all the personal problems they were having at home. They're a junior trying to realize what am I doing for school? Where am I going? So we just had that conversation. And I remember after I finished wrapping their ankle, they're like, you know what? I needed this talk. Thanks for being there for me. And so they hopped off that table, went, had a good game. And I remember when they left that locker room, I was like, you know what? There's a, there's a space, there's a need for this. My mom and my mom and my sister are both therapists as well. Um, so I always knew I wanted to be in a helping profession, whether it be therapy or anything, advocating for people. And so I come from a sports family. We all love sports, have people that have been in football. And so I knew I needed to integrate both of my passions together. And that's when it hit me after taping my friend's ankle during that time that I was like, there's a need for this. There's a space. We have coaches, but we don't go to our coaches. We have school counselors, but we don't go to our school counselors because they don't understand the demands. So I, from that point on, I strive to be that safe space, even for my friends in high school that were um, athletes and playing and having these demands on them. Safe space. I guess you could say friends are not far. You see how- Yeah, that's a that? good one. You see how I did that? Thank yes. you, Miss Natalia, for stopping by the Locked On Texan podcast, gracing us with your time today. I truly appreciate it because- uh, it is Mental Health Month, and I think it's very important to use this month in every capacity that people who have a platform can to uh, one, a couple of things to let people know you're not alone. There's resources and there are people out there that will hear you and help you through whatever you're going uh, going through. Would you please let everybody know where they can find you on social media? That's your professional social media and any other spaces that people can contact you. Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me on Instagram at bestbyfar.plc. And I have my email um, linked to that account as well. So if you ever need anything, have questions, just feel free to hit me an email and I will get back to you. Awesome. Thank you once again. And I can't wait to put this out. Let the world know, our listeners and viewers know that this is important. And there's people like you in a professional field that are out there really doing work and making a change. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. You are Locked On Texans, your daily podcast on the Houston Texans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.